Emotional gut punches, hard as nails boss fights and deep diving fan theories. Welcome to this special Final Fantasy VII Rebirth edition of the PlayStation Access Podcast. Hello and welcome to the PlayStation Access Podcast, the official podcast of PlayStation UK. I am Rob Pearson, your host. Joining us today, we have Rosie Caddick. Oh, first name and surname. This is a very formal introduction. Hello. Hello. Isn't that why you're in trouble? Yeah, oh mm. dear. Well, it's because it's a, a special day today because we have a special guest. <laughs> Amy Mallett is also with us. The reason Amy joins us today is because Amy is a big Final Fantasy fan, much like myself, much like Rosie, and it's a special edition of the podcast today because we are diving into Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. This is a special one-off spoiler cast talking all about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So here is your warning. If you have not yet finished Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, stop watching and or listening to this right now go and finish Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and then come back, because we are going weapons-free. Everything in the game is up for discussion today, and probably we'll also be talking about Final Fantasy VII Remake. I don't know why you would have finished Rebirth and not Remake, but you know, if you've not finished Remake, if you've not played and finished the original Final Fantasy VII, if you've not played Crisis Core, if you've not watched Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, all of those things may come up in this podcast. So with that out of the way, I am really, I've been holding on to this for so long, not being able to talk about this openly in the office in case someone who hasn't finished it yet hears. Mm -hmm. We're now in a safe space where all three of us have finished the game. I wanted to just kick off the discussion. We'll get to the ending later. I wanted to kick things off just by asking everyone, what was your favourite bit? What was your favourite ah, chapter? Oh. So many bits. This was really hard because when uh, I saw Rob gave us a, a couple of questions just to prepare for in advance. And when it was like, what's your favourite chapter? I went through all of them and literally I was there thinking... Such I love a rosy thing to I do. I was like... Oh. One, two, two three. Yeah, but I was like, you what happens track, in each though, chapter? Don't you? It's yeah. such a massive game. Because they all just flow together. And I was like, I love this part from this chapter and this one from this and this one. Well, this that's one. all right, Rosie. You don't have to say... Just what, a collection of your favourite bits. Okay, well, probably... Well, when I well, I, I did I did decide on a favorite chapter oh, okay. for the whole thing, and I think my favorite chapter is chapter twelve um, because that's the chapter where you go back to the golden saucer and you have the the date sequence mm -hmm. and the moment when you're in the theater absolutely mm. blew me away. Oh God, I yeah. have a real soft spot for. Uh, theatrical productions and when I was watching the sequence that you have it reminded me of the Honey Bee Inn in Final Fantasy 7 Remake where you're just embracing this massive show and I loved it I loved Barrett in red as like the the villains of the story it was absolutely mm. amazing I, I, that bit really did blow me away mm, yeah. favorite, when you had to choose between like who is your love yeah. and yeah. just hovering over people and they're all like <gasps> yeah, <but> like, <laughs> even the villains yeah. are like Ooh. Yeah. Barrett, Barrett's like oh and because Barrett is high camp and I love it when they really panto up Barrett's yeah. Yeah. Of, like performances because his voice actor as well is just incredible like so good so that was definitely like, so you had that part in chapter 12 and there was also a moment with Zach and Marlene where Marlene's telling Zach a bit more about Aerith's uh, death and is that the scary man is going to kill her bit? yeah it's like oh. scary man's coming in and she's like you have to believe me and Zach goes it, you know after everything that's happened yes I do believe you and that's when he decides that he has to go uh, to visit Hojo to get a cure for Cloud and Aerith as well there's just so many things I remember witnessing that chapter and there were so many things I was like oh, 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 like the whole time I think that one really stood out to me and then you've got the epic fight sequence at the end in the like arena uh, so that just is one that really I was like oh this is a good chapter I mean that 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 boss rush at the end of chapter 12 yeah <laughs> flipping egg <laughs> I, I enjoyed oh, chapter yeah. 12 but it took a lot out of me when it when you're like okay I've beaten Don Corneo and his pet now that's over and then the Turks come along mm. you're like oh alright game yeah I've beaten three fights and Don Corneo and the Turks and then Rufus comes out literally the hardest boss in the entire game in my opinion 
Oh, the solo fights in general were was, just unforgiving. As soon as you're one party member by yourself, everything is just like so much more challenging to think mm. about yeah. how you're going to pre- conserve your health, how you're going to kind of like exploit the strategies and the weaknesses. Because Rufus took me a while to get as well, because it's the counter thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like if you just go straight for him, he counters you, you straight touch away. Him. You can't you have to touch stagger him, him yeah. when he's going to reload. Um, but yeah, it's so much harder when Cloud's suddenly on his Todd and all of your mates are just standing They're back. They're just gone. Well, yeah. Cloud, Cloud gets up off the floor takes longer than yeah. Rufus reloading. So <laughs> you've, got to, you've got, to be, got to be good at dodging. You've got to be able to dodge his attacks and then quickly get in. That that fight took me a good five or six tries. I will. Yeah. I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit. Really tough fight, but really great. Mu- I mean, the music throughout the whole game is incredible. Mm. That f- I love Rufus's battle theme. Yeah. Very cool. I won't lie, when Rufus first, like, when he appears from the ground in the arena, it immediately gave me flashbacks to doing hard mode in Final Fantasy VII Remake because I remember in Remake, I thought uh, Rufus was the toughest boss yeah, there. Yeah, massively. And so as soon as I saw him, I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not coin, even just Rufus, He's, he's going to use that coin again. And oh, there he goes. Oh, floom, plumbing coin toss. Yeah. yeah. It's not even just Rufus, is it, though? You've got Darkstar as well. I you actually just... like that. There's a bit of respite when Darkstar came out because I was like, oh, here, finally, here's something I can hit for a bit. <laughs> just going to constantly dodge me. It's like my ATB was just, as soon as Dark Star came out, I was like, this is, this is easy now. Mm. Rufus on his own. That's, that's yeah. the problem. Mm. Yeah, 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 definitely. What yeah. about you, Amy? What was your favourite chapter? Oh, or? Just like you, I, I really struggled with this question because there were lots of elements for me about Costa del Sol that I thought were brilliant. Mm. I thought Costa del Sol really brought the levity. It's really giving like your mates on holiday. The fact that they all go and get changed and kind of like go and take part in mini games. And there's a real sort of like break from the kind of epic quest that is the chase for Sephiroth during that moment in Costa del Sol. So I loved that. But I think my favourite overall was probably Gone Gaga. I Just was actually thinking Gongaga as well. Gongaga for me. So I love Zach. Um, and if you haven't played Crisis Core, I mean, it's feasible that you might have got to, uh, you might have got three remake and three rebirth without playing Crisis Core. Crisis Core is brilliant. So good. So, so good. I played it on PSP back in the day and it's fantastic. I keep telling Robert Pearson to play it because it's so yeah. good. I, I didn't have a PSP when it came out. Mm. So I, I didn't play it, but I was so interested in it that yeah. I I looked up what happened ah, so I'm know. sort of, I'm sort <laughs> yeah, of aware yeah, yeah. of the story beats mm, having having yeah. never actually played the game myself yeah. so you know it's something I always mean to go back and try especially now that it's now they've you know, got a it's, reunion it's on version uh, PS4 yeah. and PS5 PS4. so I've got no excuse really but yeah, it's always been a bit of a, a mm. bit of a black hole for me. Anyway, please go on. No, no, I was just going to say, so for that reason, Zach's kind of, Zach's origin story is very close to my heart. So visiting Gongaga in the detail that you get in Rebirth as opposed to sort of OG was something that was really fascinating to me. That scene where Eris speaks to Zach's parents is just, oh, so much more intense. I love that Because bit. obviously, yeah, like she doesn't know if he's dead or alive and she goes back to effectively speak to what would have been her in-laws. Um, and that brilliant scene when she comes out and Cloud's kind of like, yeah, you know, forget about him. He's probably, you know, he's probably dead. He's probably got loads of women. And it's sort of very bitter from Cloud because obviously he quite likes Aerith. And that love triangle almost becomes like a, a love quadrilateral, I guess, at that point, because you've got Zach and Tifa and Aerith kind of, and Cloud all together. Um, and obviously Cisne as well, who's in Crisis Core. My girl Cisne, she's fantastic. And she's a really cool character. She used to be a Turk. Now she's kind of just like the, you know, running Gongaga's kind kind of military, isn't she? Like private army. That was really cool. And then you have, on top of like discovering Zack's hometown and all of those little parallels of Cloud and Zack, you then have the Gongaga reactor, which is insanely cool. That's Some when stuff Tifa goes down in that oh reaction, my it? god, yeah. a major story um, deviation from the original because Cloud obviously attempts to kill Tifa, attempts to just slash her up when she's at the top of the reactor and she falls into the live stream. It's very reminiscent of what happens. I think you said to me actually in Medeal. I'd kind of forgotten about that from the OG game. Yeah, but that memory journey that you go on and there's with a bit where she's she's inside the weapon and she's yeah. sort of like piecing together memories from Nibelheim that is yes. very yes. reminiscent of the scene in the original game where Tifa is helping Cloud yes, do just figure that out who after he, is. he yeah. I believe he falls in the live stream yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. in in Medeal and and is it has like major Marco poisoning for a mm. while but yeah, yeah definitely 
echoes of that scene in that Massively, segment. Massively, yeah. And you see the white whispers, the black whispers. It kind of alludes to what's going to happen at the ending, which we'll get to in a moment. But yeah, I thought Gongaga was brilliant. I thought it had... The fight with Scarlett is tough as nails. That is a really, really tough fight. And I just think, yeah, that section was kind of really where it escalated for me. You saw the weapons in action. Yeah. You saw what was really at stake and you kind of got really awesome flashbacks to, you know, Zach's life. There's even a side quest that I loved where you find Zach's little personal training gym where he used to yeah. come and Cloud teaches the guy to do the little Zach squats. And oh, it's yes. super cute yeah, and awesome. I remember seeing that. Yeah. That was great. Did either of you do the side quest with the chicken? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Literally. God. Can we talk about how that last chicken can get in a KFC bargain bucket, please? Yeah, but it does. That's the great thing. Yeah. The ending to that quest is all like, oh, I've saved the chicken. And then the owner of the chickens is like, fate. how about some roast chicken? <laughs> yeah. just... It gets so dark, it's doesn't so it? Because all of a sudden it goes from this adorable little wholesome granny to yeah. like them all outside <laughs> looking like Red's face. Yeah, Red. Red's, Red's like, literally like, <laughs> I've questioned I've seen life. stuff. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was great because, like, the final chicken mm. is, like, miles away from the yeah, village. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm not luring that thing all the way back mm. How long did you lure on it a string. Before you realised that you uh, weren't supposed well, to. I wasn't going to do it. I was messaging <laughs> secret boss, like, I'm not doing that. I can't even remember the way back. And he was like, just give it a go, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And so I did it. And then immediately that fight happens. So yeah, I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. that's better. But yeah. the, the ending of that side quest made me laugh a lot. The game made me laugh a lot throughout yeah, the whole it's, thing. Oh, it's hysterical. Anyway, it's really, really so funny. characterful and vibrant. Were you, did you have more to say, Amy, about just chapter Gaga. nine? Oh, I've always got more to say. I think Junon was also really good as well. I think mm. Junon's parade scene was that, just brilliant. That was going to be mine. Yeah. That. Oh, okay, well, then we'll transition across yeah, to you I so was, you can talk about it. I was gonna, Chapter four, I think... It's a toss up for me between chapter four and chapter 13. Mm. Chapter four, the June and parade bit, specifically the bit where you're walking around as Cloud, mm. uh, dressed in your Shinra military disguise. Yeah. I love the scene just before that where Cloud and Aerith and Tifa are all getting changed. Yeah, just very really playful, cute. really funny. Um, and then you go out and you have to find all of the seventh infantry scattered throughout Junan. And that's the kind of task that in most games I'd be like oh god here we go gotta just find everyone mm. uh, and I approached it with that sort of mindset at first I'm like, gonna be here for a flipping ages doing this after the first one I was just completely in love with that whole bit so yeah. they didn't it's unnecessarily good that yeah. bit yeah, yeah, yeah. so full of character so funny yeah. you can find I think a maximum of 10 groups of infantry yeah. men and they're all they're all doing something funny. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's, there's a little bit of story attached to each one. Every single one. Uh, there's yeah. a group taking a, a photo with a cardboard cutout of Rufus <laughs> <laughs> and they ask you to take a photo for them. And if you take a nice photo, you get to keep the cardboard cutout of Rufus. Mm. Why Cloud would want that, I don't know. Why uh, wouldn't anyone well, want the cardboard cutout of Rufus? <laughs> I, I text Rob probably about four hours into the game, like, I fancy Rufus Shinra. Is this a problem? <laughs> and Rob was like, Maybe. Maybe. I don't know what it says I mean, about you. <laughs> you know uh, he's part of a big evil corporation, they're all, right? Uh, they're all doing something funny. There's a group hanging out in a jazz bar and the jazz musicians are playing like a, a full-on jazz cover of yeah. the Final Fantasy. I can't remember yeah. exactly which piece of music it is, but it's a piece of music from the original game. Yes, yeah. And I just stood there listening to it for about five minutes because yeah. it's genuinely so good, thinking, wow, someone actually went to the effort of creating this bespoke piece of jazz music that yeah. a lot of people are probably just going to skip on by yep. and yeah. not listen not to. Not even think about. Amazing. And Elena's sitting at the bar. Oh, I was going to say, Elena in the bar. She's I've like, actually... leave me alone. I'm busy being sad. <laughs> oh, so I've good. clipped that out for social. I love that. <laughs> she's having that day at work that we've all had because she's got her hands on the table yeah. and she's like Song probably hates me boss is gonna fire me I'm busy being it's sad oh, that's great. love her uh, and then and then you go into the special exclusive bald bar yes oh Rude's little hideout Rude is yeah. there you see him going in you're like oh what's happening here ready for something dramatic or maybe yeah. even a fight I was like I'm gonna have to fight Rude down here yeah, but yeah. no he's in his little bald only exclusive bar and they all have a little yeah. special thing they do where they no they scalp like, no it, service they squeak their heads and, yeah. they've and, got a song as well haven't they it's like yeah. um, oh. something like gleam it oh, rub, scrub it fine make it shine something like that isn't it and they're all like even the bartenders I singing really enjoyed it especially I'm sure you can 
appreciate why I, in particular, why would, would that en- enjoy that scene. Yeah, why? Uh, Do you like the, the helmets? The... Yeah. 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 Yeah, the yeah, helmets are cool. Just, it's the only place Rude can get any uh, peace from Reno. Yeah. <laughs> I just, just felt, I felt very seen in that scene. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it was just, the whole vibe of it was just so it's very joyful. Funny. And it was a re- that whole bit, even when you've got all of the infantry people following you around, mm. Technically, it was so impressive. Just like yeah. 50 soldiers just gotcha. all marching down the street after you, saying like a different thing each Every time. time yeah. They were like complimenting me on my folios. <laughs> <laughs> and all 50 of them were like, first class folios, sir! <laughs> all doing a salute. I just had a massive grin on my face, that whole yeah. section. Same. I thought it was an amazing bit of world building. Yeah. Mm. I thought mm. the whole game was is, is so effective at making you fall in love with this world. Yeah, brilliantly. And the people who live in it. But that bit in particular was was great. Mm. Uh, and chapter 13, I thought, was just an absolute banger from start to finish. Temple of the Temple Ancients? Temple of the Ancients, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Like the music in the Temple mm. of the Ancients was like a, a really evocative mix of... Some of it was the original theme from Temple of the Ancients in the original game, but there was also a little bit of the forgotten capital theme being mm. woven in, like that. Mm. Do, 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 do. They love doing a that with bit, the music. Laced a they? little bit in the background. And then yeah. the battle theme, which was a little twist on the Temple of the Ancients theme, but mm. battled up a bit. I and mean, yeah. the game does that constantly. Yeah. The, the iconic uh, just world map theme, which has been transformed into the battle theme for the grasslands mm, incredible mm. composition yeah uh, but that the, the temple of the age was just amazing the boss fights in it the boss fight against the red dragon was so cool the way it finishes with oh. a really cinema clouds like sliding under its tail in slow motion doesn't tifa do like tifa an, does yeah. like a drop kick on its head to Tifa drop kicks a dragon in the face <laughs> yes. to finish that fight. I love Tifa. What she a fight. Babe. And then you team up with the Turks. So you've got Cloud, Barrett and Tifa teaming up with Rude and Reno to fight some monsters. Mm. And then you get like a little Advent style, Advent children style cutscene where they're fighting each other. And then it goes into a boss fight against them. That whole bit was just great. Yeah. That whole boss fight against the Turks and Temple of the Agent is just a big bit of fan service. I mean, the whole mm. game feels like a huge bit of fan service but that mm. fight in particular was like I know the Turks are cool we know the Turks are cool we know you yeah, love the they're Turks they're my favourites they're have my this, boys. The have this really cool fight with Rude and Reno mm. it's not in the original game you don't fight the Turks in the Temple of the Ancients in the original mm. game but it's like who cares? Just yeah. have a really yeah. great fight against them. It's great for Reno as well, bless him, because he's been out of he's rebirth. He's been on holiday the he gets whole time. Gets a little comeback. Oh, it was so good. And then that you know your party's split into two, uh, uh, that section in the game. Mm. So then about half an hour later, you get to fight Zeng and Elena, which is mm. the first time you actually get to fight Zeng. Because yeah. you don't get yeah. to fight him at all in the original game. Um, that fight has a, a really cool little jazzy style Turks theme. boss battle yeah, theme to it. Yeah, yeah. I love how they weave the Turks theme into everything. Thing. They've got so many different versions of yeah. that. Da, da, da. Like there's a real sort of in the first game in remake, there's a real guitar heavy yes. one for Reno. Yeah. And then there's kind of the jazzy one for Song and Elena. And then yeah, they just I think you're so right about how they use motifs, how they bring back because I was constantly throughout the whole game just being like, oh, that's Genova's theme. Yeah. Or oh, that's a little bit of the old battle theme. Or oh my god, that's that. And it just I think they're so clever at mixing them together so seamlessly, especially in longer battles as well. Yes. Because it must be just from a technical standpoint, so clever that you can do that and not know when that piece of music yeah. like realistically Well, they ends. have like the different phases to the bosses yeah. and they all seem to have like different bits of music attached to those phases. Where it escalates, The yeah. boss fights are all quite big, drawn out, epic, climactic events. Much like in Remake where I felt like every boss encounter was like a real moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And those boss themes, they just, they work so well because the game knows you have to go from phase one to phase two to phase three of the boss fight and the way the music transitions between those phases my favorite example of it actually is at the end of chapter two when you fight the midgard zorma mm. yes. and you've got the starts the traditional battle theme starts getting a little bit more epic and it reminded me of the crab warden theme i think it's a rehash of the crab yes. warden theme from yeah, remake yeah, yeah. then you get to phase three of the fight and it's like a drum and bass remix <laughs> yes. of, the, of the original battle theme yes. i was like oh my god and it did it did beta the classic enemy skill move beta mm-hmm. and it, and you get that bit in the fight where the drums are pounding it does that area of, of effect move where mm. i can't one of your party i think it's barrett is like 
get off the floor and you get like a proper floor is lava moment you have to get to dry land out yeah. of the bog otherwise it completely wipes you out uh, but the amount of times where a crescendo in the music would coincide with me doing a really cool synergy ability or a limit break those moments mm. you just can't you can't predict and yeah. when they happen organically you just feel like such a badass yeah. Yeah. I remember I finished that snake off with a limit break from Cloud right when the music really kicks into mm. gear and I just felt absolutely amazing in that yeah. moment uh, and the game just gives so many of those moments to you yeah just absolutely amazing absolutely stunning yeah. yeah I love the way you can sort of sometimes during a battle as well I would find myself mesmerised by pausing to issue a command yes and you'd pause in a position where Cloud's like upside down his beautiful anime hair is flowing his sword's above his head I just knocked the microphone because I got so excited <laughs> and he's sort of like just the slow-mo of it and you hear the echo of like Barrett being like ah oh, I get this and stuff like that I love it Even when you get the echo mid-conversation yeah. oh, the sound design of a fight is different every time it mm -hmm. feels interesting intrinsically like it's your playthrough which is so hard for a game to do and yeah I just think I can't say enough good things about the sound and the music the Valkyrie as well is our, one of our favourite battle themes yes um, I know we always really sort of say that is like a piece of music that in remake I remembered that piece of music almost more than I did the fight the fight's great yeah but actually that like da -da 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 is just like a motif that when they use it it feels so heroic yes and they use it again don't well, they, they for, I think I'm pretty sure they brought the Valkyrie back just so we could yeah, hear that bit of music again. Yeah. It's like, you know, oh, well, should we should fight the Valkyrie there. Yeah, let's put the Valkyrie yeah. in just because I know, we know everyone loves this bit of music. They used it in the first, in the Summer Games Fest reveal trailer for they Rebirth. Did, yes. They used the Valkyrie yes, theme in there. excited about that. Uh, just a brilliant bit of music. It was a bit of music I didn't realise I liked as much as I did mm. until I was just listening to the soundtrack for Remake and it came on. I was like, mm. this is great, this yeah, bit yeah. of music. And oh, yeah. so good. If you're on the way to work, just put that on and you will feel so <laughs> epic yes. by the time you I'm arrive. I'm ready to do the paperwork. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, I think we've already talked a little bit about this, but I just wanted to ask favourite boss fight hardest boss fight hardest. we've, talk, we've hardest. talked about bosses here favourite or hardest a lot both oh. there's I mean I've already said that I thought the hardest boss fight was Rufus in chapter 12 okay cool. really that's the one where I died to I died against him f five or six times okay no other bosses really took me longer than one or two goes to to, mm. to take out yeah um but I'm, I'm keen to hear what your thoughts about the other bosses are. I'll let you go first, because I think mine transitions into the ending chat a bit well. A bit well. A bit well. <laughs> a bit well. I've, I've been sitting next to you too long. I'm picking up my phrases. <laughs> picking up my random phrases. I think I thought that the yin and yang boss was the hardest. It's the one in chapter 11 when you're... Uh, Kate Sith. Kate Sith. Oh my God. And you are solo Kate Sith and yin and yang has this thing, depending on... It's got like two faces and depending on which one it is, it's either physical attacks or magic attacks mm -hmm. so you've got to manage that with Kate Sith who is a bit of both but mainly I built my my character build was all on luck so even then it's not as if I had loads of magic spells or anything like that because as soon as you as he joined your party it's like oh here's a coincidental thing to raise your luck I thought okay his benefit is going to be he's going to have some really strong powers if he has luck um so I was fighting that fight I knew exactly what I had to do, but still, Yin and Yang does give you a good old few punches. It I remember, was tough. It was yeah, so hard. it was the hardest fight with Kate Sith was when you had to fight two of those scale yeah, monsters yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. Was I that died was... on that a stupid amount of times for mm. for a normal enemy, you know, for not a boss. Yeah, yeah. and I had to use the Moogle as damage control. My poor Moogle was a little fluffy punching bag. I, I just kept summoning him <laughs> so that he'd get beaten you up. You fully so have Kate that panic right. where um, you fall off the Moogle and then you're like, "Where's my Moogle? I need it back." Or it's like you have to build up your ATB again to summon up the fat. Moogle. Um, I love where's my Moogle? Where's my where Moogle? Where do I park my Moogle? Uh, but yeah, I remember that boss being pretty tough because already we're just learning how to use the, the character with their build and things like that. Uh, so and now it's you're up against a tough boss fight against it with these two switching mm. gameplay styles. Um, so I remember that one being particularly tough, I thought. And also the electricity moves. I remember I kept on like blocking them and trying to dodge them at the right time, but uh, he's not the fastest mover. So no. when it came to like uh, thunder, like dropping down on me, a lot of time I just got slapped or zapped. And I just remember, I remember dying on that one a good few amount of times. So mm -hmm. I think that was probably the boss I died to the most, but we got there in the end. Cool. What would you we say? We always Amy? get there in the end. Always get there. Always, always get, get there, there in the end. end. We persevere. Mm. Say what you like about us Final Fantasy fans. We persevere. <laughs> we get there in the end. Um, so do you want my hardest? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So my hardest 
was actually Sephiroth the very last fight in I've, the game. I've heard some people having problems with this. I'll tell you for why. I got to the point where the game in chapter 14 is like, right, this is your last resting spot. Yeah. After this, you and your characters, you're going to rush to Aerith's side. So equip the material that you want, you know, sort out your gear and equipment, be ready because this is your last stand, your last yeah. chance to alter anything. So I put every bit of material, obviously, that I needed on Cloud and his party. I didn't put anything on Aerith. Because I thought, well, she's oh, possibly going to oh, kick the bucket. Oh, dear, oh, dear, And oh, also, dear. it kind of implied that, you know, we were going to get to her, but she <laughs> might not have been in the final fight. You can see where this is going. Yep. <laughs> so when we got to Sephiroth, right, she comes out that portal and she's like, hi, oh, I'm so radiant. And I'm like, you've got Breach equipped to you and that's it. <laughs> and nothing <laughs> else. I think she had cleansing. So she could cast Poisona and she could cast Breach and that was it. I had she secret had with a Nothing. similar he was like he was messaging oh. me saying I can't do this bit like Aerith I've not been using Aerith she's still got starter level gear on game? I was like what? what are you talking about secret boss that yeah. is appalling it for wasn't shame. that that's, that's for shame it wasn't her gear for it shame. was just I hadn't equipped any decent material I hadn't <laughs> planned for her to be in that final fight well you get the um, you know the, the funny thing is when you lose a fight in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, you're you're presented with like a list of four restart <laughs> options and it's not always clear which is the one yeah, that takes yeah. you back restart just, from to this the, battle. just to that battle you were just doing or yeah. which one takes you back like to the start of the whole sequence. Yeah, yeah. restart from checkpoint, restart yeah. from last battle, restart yeah. from last battle before that, restart from this battle restart before from this beginning, before that. the beginning of the battle. And the thing <laughs> is, there's one death animation that Sephiroth does where I think it's like the Octo Slash because it's his limit break, isn't mm-hmm. it? He does. He does Octo Slash and he absolutely annihilates you. Like it's just so many different um, sword slashes and uppercuts. And if you get caught in that, you can't sort of dodge or roll away. Yeah. You're just kind of like hacked to pieces and you've got to hope that you have HP left when he's done yeah he kept killing me and Aerith so much with that and then there's one bit where he sort of zooms past the camera and cinematically it goes into his face and it went into his face as I got the game over so my game over screen is Sephiroth going (laughs) 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 and I was just like this is because it looked like he was staring into my soul Mm. like you're gonna have to go all the way back all the way back through all these bosses I got you Amy (laughs) Mallet yeah and that was the moment when my dog came in put her butt in my face and was just like do you want to play and I was like (laughs) not now Peggy Um, yeah it was it was really hard I struggled a lot and it took me probably about seven or eight attempts to do it just because I kept thinking to myself if I just go back and I do all of the sort of the Genova life clinger boss and all the other bosses again it'll be fine put different material on Aerith Mm -hmm. I've got it made Mm. but I was stubborn (laughs) I didn't want to go all the way back through all those bosses so I just did like god knows how many attempts until i finally won this is this is interesting because this i think we'll be talking about this particular bit of the final boss fight mm. later in the podcast mm-hmm. um because i think i've i've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole since finishing this game you and me both uh and there's something about that final bit where it's cloud and Aerith versus sephiroth um Aerith's really good in that fight yeah uh, i like I, I quite often switch between characters when I play it anyway. I know some people like to play it differently. They will mm. control maybe just cloud and input commands and other characters when their ATB is ready. I'm like constantly flipping between I characters. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah, to I control yeah. whoever. If I'm doing commands on someone, I like to control them for a bit. Um, and so switching to Aerith, like you can you can stop Sephiroth doing those attacks by destroying his Masamune mm. or yes. destroying yes, his yeah, yeah. wing to just yes. clip him a little bit, Vulnerable make him a little bit magic, weaker. isn't it, as well? Uh, yeah. And Aerith absolutely annihilates either the sword or the or wing the yeah. much yeah. more effectively than Cloud can. Yeah. Uh, and there's, you know, there are little, there's maybe stuff going on in that battle mm. um, that could be relevant to the story or it could be people who I've been watching on the internet taking things a little bit too far. Uh, but I, I really enjoy all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I love that you've got a tin hat that's shaped oh, like cloud. I, I've shaped got like my, cloud stripes hair. <laughs> little tin I've, got foil my, hat. I've got my cloud strife tin foil hat yes. firmly on mm. for the rest of this podcast. I've got my I've got my board with all my red strings on it. Are we delving in now? Is it delving in time? It's, I think it's time to delve in. Yes, uh, okay. I just want to start this bit by just asking you sort of you know we're not gonna we're gonna talk about our personal interpretations of the ending Mm -hmm. uh because i i think the the ending is deliberately constructed so as to not be obvious like if you don't understand what happened at at the end 
that is absolutely intentional. You're yes. not supposed yes. to. You're mm-hmm. supposed to be discussing it. You're supposed mm-hmm. to be having your own interpretations of it. But yep. before we get into that, I just want to ask you sort of just just your initial emotional response to what happens at the end. Mm-hmm. How did it make you feel? Man, I mean, that's a, like weirdly, that's such a big question because... Uh, if you've played the original, we've all had the same emotion mm. with particularly the scene where Aerith gets stabbed by Sephiroth. Mm. But here in this scene, uh, well, sorry, but here in Rebirth, not only do you have that, but you don't because so many things, the game is literally chucking all of your emotions and your thoughts left, right and centre. Mm. You can't help but just process everything and literally just go like, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was, if anything... I was more intrigued. I was so invested into what the game is doing mm. um, with these multiple timelines and how everything's going. And especially between Cloud and Aerith with that initial ending scene with how those two act, mm. act to each other. And yeah. uh, there was a moment where Cloud, you can see him holding Aerith and Tifa just has flashes of some moments seeing blood on Cloud's hands. Mm. And then like, sometimes it's not. The whole time I was just so like, what is happening? It's deliberately this- disorientating. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I, my initial thoughts, even on the, the the final scene which was really sad I got I got a bit teary eyed when you see like Tifa and Red you know when she's like lending crying you just see Red just sitting with her but again even when but my like you know my little lump in my throat immediately went when Aerith then touched Red and even he goes Aerith yeah. and then again I was just like what's happening mm. so it was a real roller coaster of emotions going but mainly my initial ins- response was intrigue and mm. oh my gosh this was fantastic mm. i want to talk about my theories and what's happening so much yeah, so i'd definitely. say i'd say probably that yeah yeah what I need about to, you amy i needed to lie down i needed to lie down <laughs> first yeah. i think one thing that i would say i felt instantly was actually appreciation because i think what is so brilliant about how rebirth ends is that it exploits what is such a pivotal moment not just in final fantasy 7 but in video games in yeah. gaming generally right there's never been an instance like this in video game history where we as the audience know that a character could potentially be killed yeah, yeah. like Eret's death was so incredibly crucial to you know the original game and it was such a massive moment that had everyone just like what like the fact that we know that it's a real anomaly, you know, for mm-hmm. a video game to kind of have that dramatic irony where we as the player are kind of going in like, oh my God, like this could, will it be different this time? Will it not? Yeah. And the moment where Cloud is walking up and you're having to hold R2 and L2. So mm-hmm. like you push- hold? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're talking for the push. I was still thinking about the, sorry, I, I jumped too soon. <laughs> you know the bit because he obviously holds it above yeah. her head because we know in the original he goes to kill her, doesn't he? Which yeah. is kind of the Genova sort of Sephiroth messing with his head. But that whole section just, I screamed. I actually screamed at the TV when he knocks him back because you're just like, oh my God, you have no way of yeah. knowing how it's going to go. And I think that's so clever that the developers of the game exploited that wonderful sense of this has happened before. We know it's happened before this way, mm-hmm. but there's no way of knowing which way it's going to go this time round. And that sense of not knowing I loved. I'm a huge fan of obscure endings as well. Like I'm a big Lynch fan. I love it when things are so completely muddled and confusing that you have to sit with it for days afterwards yeah. Yeah. to really get a sense of what you think happened. And I must admit that, yeah, all night I was just laying there like, I, I drew a diagram. I should have brought it in. <laughs> I drew a diagram as well. I was like, Zach, like little sort of stick figure with funny hair. I was like, Zach. Eris, no, that's not right. Scrub that out. Okay, Sephiroth <laughs> here. Parrot, that parrot. <laughs> oh, my parrot. favorite character. <laughs> I was going to say, what timeline have you been watching? I think I tried to say party the and parrot. parrot. Version. <laughs> the parrot version. Um, the parrot and his party and obviously everything that happens where you're switching between worlds. It was brilliant. But yeah, I needed, I needed a moment to process. And yeah. like you say, intrigue was definitely something, but I think appreciation for how clever it was that they'd given us this experience, yeah. which is such an anomaly in video games to know that going in. Yeah. Yeah, He's just fantastic. I I completely agree with you. Uh, there was a moment where I sort of like I wasn't feeling a particular emotion, but I mm-hmm. felt an overwhelming surge of just many emotions. Yes, yes. when I yeah, realised, yeah. and it's it's that moment, right? That you're you're absolutely bang on. I think Amy, when it's you're you're walking towards Aerith, you know mm. the whole game has been building towards this. Mm. We've mm. had these unanswered questions now for four years since remake came out and the ending of that game posed the question could things be different this time yeah i.e 
can you save Aerith? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which even back in 1997, I remember reading official oh, PlayStation magazine. God, there were yeah. loads of like cheat articles and codes where like, can you save Aerith? Yeah, if it was you like do a, this, you might get a thing. change it. And, you know, this was before the days of internet guides being able to tell you absolutely everything about a game. Mm playground discussions yeah the, you know kids used to make stuff up you know you obviously make stuff about games and there was, there was there's a kid in every school who's like i know how you can save Eric. <laughs> or you can go here into the slums that guy who's in the pipe if you bring him a certain item at a certain time of day mm. uh you can go then go to the church and see eris's ghost mm. uh that is true though you, you do can see, see like, a glimpse like a glimpse of Aeris, of her. yeah like a flicker and yeah. you don't know whether it's like a glitch or yeah. a mistake uh but this is a question it made me realize in that moment and it was the moment where you get to Aerith and the camera pans up and you know Sephiroth's coming down. Mm. That moment, it just really hanged. Mm -hmm. And it was such a loaded moment. I felt all of a sudden not like it was four years of wondering what's going to happen. I felt, all of, I felt like it was 27 years of yeah. Yeah. this moment has been mm. playing over and over in my mind. Yep. And knowing he was about to come down. And like you say, when Cloud was like, no, and he blocks oh. the thing. I was like, oh my God, they've actually done it. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, yeah. seconds later, going from like, oh, to what? Oh, yeah. no. And then she yeah. starts falling and she's dead. And then Cloud starts getting confused. And, you know, we've been seeing this from Cloud throughout the game. He's, he's, you know, if you've played the original, you will know that Cloud has the unreliable narrator thing going yep, on where he, he, is, him, yeah. he has misremembered or forgotten or like blocked away mm. the trauma of losing his best friend, Zack. And he's created an alternate reality in his head where mm. he takes the place of Zack and he's the hero. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, this isn't new for Cloud. Cloud does mm. this when... When bad things happen to Cloud, he he's not very good at processing it mm -hmm. and he will create alternate realities where he heroically avoids the bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so immediately you're thinking to yourself, because just before this, you've had Sephiroth show you literally the true nature of reality, as Sephiroth mm -hmm. calls it, where he's shown you multiple mm -hmm. timelines, yeah. multiple yep. universes multiple all converging. Yeah. Um and so you've got that in your head. You know that choices can create branching narrative paths, but you also know that Cloud has previous when it comes to you're so right. This is creating exactly artificial. Th and so when he blocks the thing, <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Has has he actually done that? Has he actually done that? Mm. Has he created an alternate timeline where he has saved Aerith? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was the case. Yeah. Probably for a couple of days after I'd finished it. Because what happens mm. after this scene, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite confusing. You've got, you know, a, a, a contradiction of imagery. You have the rest of yeah. the party rushing in. Mm -hmm. They see something different to what Cloud is seeing. They're yep. seeing Aerith blood. dead. Yep. They're seeing yeah. blood. Sephiroth, you know, after the parry, the sword, the Masamune gets stuck in the ground mm. and then it glitches and f shifts and the angle of it changes mm. and it's there's blood on it and mm. Sephiroth like flicks the blood off yeah and he says to Cloud I think he says something like you you will never see the truth with such clouded, clouded eyes, eyes or yeah. something like that yep and you know and that's confusing as well because you know that Sephiroth is you know this is what he does yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he lies to you yeah he the truth. tries to manipulate you and he tries to so you can't rely on what Sephiroth is saying either. Yeah. You can't rely on what Cloud is perceiving. And we as the audience are at that moment in the game looking through Cloud's eyes. We're mm -hmm. looking through clouded eyes at that scene. Yeah. Uh, mm. And so, and it's intentionally like that, right? They're, yeah. They're, yeah, you're, yeah. You're supposed to be left like, have I saved her? Is yeah. there a yeah. world where I have saved her? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the way it puts you inside Cloud's head, initially I was like, oh man, like, you know, we didn't get to see the scene where he lowered it into the water. And I think there's a reason for that. I, I do. do think that's significant. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There is because Cloud, the implication, right? And I think we've we've gone on to interpretations of the ending sort of naturally here. Mm. Um, the implication is when it goes to that scene and they're all sitting around the lake and they're all mourning Aerith's death. Mm. Uh, we don't see Cloud lowering Aerith into the water because Cloud doesn't remember that happening. Mm. Cloud has blocked that out. Yep. The implication is he has just done that, I think. Mm. Uh, but we don't see it because Cloud hasn't seen it because at that stage of the game, he's 
he still he hasn't he is refusing to believe that Aerith is dead. He's yeah. doing the same thing that he's done when Zack died. Yeah. He's yeah. creating yeah, yeah. an artificial reality to protect himself from mm. that emotional trauma. So do you think then that that is the nature of the fact that he can see sort of Aerith alive? Do you think it's fictitious and it's a repress it's him repressing the truth? Or do you think that there is actually a timeline? Effectively, it's can we trust Cloud being the unreliable narrator mm-hmm. or knowing what we now know about the multiverses? Is I, it that there is? Because you do see yeah. when he pushes the sword back, there is that um, big cloud of kind of what looks like, I love how the multiverse is depicted actually in this game. It's yeah. kind of like an oil spillage, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. like rainbow effects yeah. and it's full of like shards and textures mm. and fragments. It's really colourful. You get a flash of that as mm-hmm. he does it, which makes me think you see that whenever a portal opens and it's implying a kind of multiverse thing. So I do think there is quite possibly, you know, that it might be that they opened up a branch there by defying fate we know that by defying yeah. fate that's what happens it splinters off so quite possibly he could have done a different timeline but what makes me really nervous is that when cloud is holding her the flashes that you get of her alive her not alive is very similar to what you get when Genova is revealing the truth to him or clouding his mm-hmm. memory or mm. kind of like causing him to suddenly remember things that were repressed in his psyche so i think it could i think it could be either or and i go back and forth on whether i think cloud himself yeah. has just witnessed her death and is blocking it um because that's classic cloud and also it would make, kind of make sense with where the story could go but also yeah i think there is also that possibility the timeline thing is something that won't leave my brain i I think they're keeping your hope dangling aren't they yeah i mean i don't think there is any way i don't think there's any other way they could have ended this game yeah Mm. because it's so they can't wrap things up we we know there are plans for the third game in the remake project to come um and you go through all of these emotions, you feel like, oh, I wanted to see that particular scene, or mm. I don't know fully still whether Aerith is alive or dead. Clearly she is dead in at least one, at mm. least the main yeah. timeline. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Barrett yeah. and Tifa in Red 13, Kate Seth, Yuffie, Vincent said they're all reacting to Aerith dying. Yeah. Not being um, yeah. But yeah, and it's intentionally throwing up that question, but did you save her in one? Is there a branch of reality where Cloud did save her? Mm. Or is cloud just losing his mind yeah um i initially thought the former mm. i'm now i now believe that he didn't save her at all mm. i think i think she's dead in all timelines um and i think there are there are certain things that happen so when you're when you're going through the multiple timelines with zach um and you realize okay there's not just two here mm. there's like oh there's a different breed of dog johnny's coming out with a, like a plushie of uh yeah um like a different breed there's of like dog four different there's, stamps, there's a isn't bunch yeah. of different yeah. so uh if you um and i i read an article by alex donaldson from vg247 he's like one of my go-to guys for final mm. fantasy stuff so if, if you've if you're not aware of alex's work i'd really recommend checking him out and he wrote an article for rpg site Mm. really analysing all of the different strands of reality that are in play at that moment. I think it's like five or six or seven. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's one where Zach chooses to save Biggs. There's one where he chooses to go to the church where Aerith is. There's one where he chooses to save Cloud. Mm. Uh, in each of them, it seems to be there's a bunch of Shinra troops after Zach. That's mm. how he dies Originally, originally right? Yeah. That's his yeah. original death scene, which he seemingly escapes at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake. Mm. Um, but it, uh, the way I interpreted that was there are, there are some events in this story that no matter what timeline you're in, they're coming for you. They're hunting you down. They're inevitable. They're going to yeah. happen. Mm. And I think Zack being killed or being mowed down by a bunch of Shinra soldiers mm. is one of them. It's quite Final Destination, isn't it? There yes. are some mm. things that are I fixed. think so. Yeah. And I think this is like a... There are lots of multiverse stories around in pop culture at the moment. Mm. And a, a theme that often ties them together, I think, is what you would call canon events. Mm. They're like, there, are, there are events which have to happen mm. in all of these timelines and all of the timelines sort of branch off these events. Mm. Uh, and my interpretation of the Aerith death scene, if you can call it that, is that that is one such event. Like Aerith dying is a thing that has to happen. Yes, uh, And I think that... There is, there's definitely that, that image of 
the multiverse potentially being created, that visual motif of, like you said, Amy, the rainbow effect happening when he blocks the sword. Yep. But I think it's important to realise that just before that, Sephiroth has revealed to Cloud the nature of the multiverse. Mm. And so Cloud has it in his head that he can potentially change reality by making certain choices. Mm. And I think it's still consistent with Cloud creating an artificial reality. He has created an artificial reality where in one reality he saved Aerith. Mm. That's my interpretation of it. But the beauty of it is I could be completely wrong and it yeah. could be that he has saved her. Yeah. Um, but I I sadly think that the Aerith's a goner mm. uh, and that the Aerith that appears to Cloud is it's either a product of his imagination or, and this is another, another strand to the conspiracy theory hole that I've fallen down, mm. um, that that Aerith could be like a construct of Genova or Sephiroth trying to manipulate Cloud. Yeah. So I watched, uh, I watched, I watched Maximilian Dude, another YouTube creator who I really enjoy listening to about Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. Uh, he did like a, a spoiler mode with Easy Allies recently. And he was talking about, okay, you look at Aerith in that scene and she's acting a little bit weird and her mm -hmm. eyes are different. And I went back and watched it and I can sort of, I can, it's the kind of thing where if you're looking for it, you can probably see it. Like yeah. I'm not a hundred percent convinced, yeah. but there is evidence there yeah. that, that it could be that. God, uh, that would be so heartbreaking, wouldn't it? Not only shattering. It's dark, right? Yeah, it's really dark. Yeah, but it's dark. great. That's, that's what I like about the storyline. Yeah, this for sure. Iteration. It that, could just be all your hope is that it's actually Genova all along. Yes, mm. which would be awful. But that is, mm. that is sort of where I am at the moment. Where I, you think, I think Cloud is really... You know, just the reaction of the other characters to Cloud as well at the end. Like, you yes. can see in Tifa's face. She's not just mm. sad that Aerith has died. She's sad that Cloud is, like, in a really bad place. You can see she's like, mm. what the heck has happened yeah, to you? Yeah, like the moment where yeah. um, Barrett says, come on, we, we, sadly, we've got to go. And then Tifa's the last to stand up and she looks at Cloud and he's just, like, smiling. He's looking at yeah. Aerith. Yeah. You know he is, but he's, in her eye, he's, he's just smiling into nothing. Like, yeah. come on. Even though we know that he's uh, looking at Aerith in his mind and Tifa's just got the look of... Oh my god! Like, yeah. what is happening? How? Why is he? Why is he not reacting? Yeah, yeah, to Aerith's absolutely. Death? Um, yeah. And then also the sky as well. Cloud can see the sky, yeah. as in the world-ending sky. The others can't. He yeah. says to them, doesn't he? You know, don't look up. Barrett's like, at what? So that's another thing as well um, that I find really interesting. I'm not sure whether. Let's hear your, your thoughts, Rosie, your theory first. I mean, mine, well, so I'm, you know, as everyone I'm sure is that everyone's jumping around. Like, mm. even when I was listening to you, Rob, I was like, oh my God, yeah, that could be, yeah, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> this is the thing, you're wrong. Yeah. You bring so a theory and then your mate's like, it comes, it's easy yeah. to be convinced, isn't it? Here but, comes oh. the Rosie's rubbish thoughts over here. I thought, <laughs> I interpreted it that there's a mixture. I still think that there are Aeriths in different universes mm. um, because one thing for example was that you had one version of Aerith who gave Cloud the holy materia yes um, mm. and then in the cutscene with the moment where Sephiroth does stab Aerith the holy materia in her hair still falls out yep. mm. so I'm like how is that holy materia back in her hair when we saw an Aerith give one to Cloud um, so that's she. He, he then gives it to Aerith in his timeline, though I think. No, oh, but he only yeah. gets it because Aerith gives it to him in yeah, chapter yeah. fourteen when they're on the date. Yes, so yeah. that's in a different timeline. That's the so the way that I'm remembering it in my head is the different stamps. So there's Terrier timeline, yeah. <laughs> there's Beagle timeline, uh -huh. <laughs> and then that one it stamp is like a kind of um, Pomeranian yeah. kind of dog. That timeline, I think is um yeah that's where she he they go on the date and yeah. he gives it he uh, she gives him the material he takes it then Sephiroth you see comes in the church yeah. behind her yeah, yeah. yes and i think the implication there is that he, he will kill he her, kill her. <laughs> yeah and i'm wondering if that was maybe because the thing is i thought oh that makes sense that's what marlene said you know mm -hmm. don't let her leave the house because when she goes Sephiroth's going to kill her yeah. yeah but then the initial timeline of Marlene and um, uh, Zach was the Terrier timeline, I think. Like that was when Stamp was a Terrier. Yeah. So it's so, there's like you said before, Rob, there's at least, just from dog breeds, there's four <laughs> yeah. different multiverses. Yeah. So it's quite obvious that what they could be showing us at different times might belong to different. For sure. When, yeah. when you have Bigsy in the pug chips and he gets shot, uh -huh. that's obviously another timeline. Yeah. And Zach gets ganged up on by the soldiers again. So yeah, I think I basically, long winded way of saying I'm with you in that I think they're, could possibly be other Aeriths out there. I think there I, is. I think, yeah. Mm. Um, 
because again, this is where I was saying I had my initial theory, which I thought, oh yeah, okay, I think this is my theory with, you know, you have the choice with Zach when he's saying, do I uh, go see Biggs or do I go see Hojo for Cloud and Aerith? And that's already establishing that there's three. But then in my head, I thought, what if there is a timeline where Cloud does save Aerith? Uh, but then in my head, I was like, hang on, in Zach's timelines, both of them are ill in bed at the moment. So how is it that they would have got to that point? So, you know, then the idea just, just you know, when you're thinking and mm-hmm. things just start growing, I was like, what if there is like a fourth timeline? Mm. Um, I think there's at least four. And also when Aerith does come out uh, ready for the fight against Sephiroth, he says, I underestimated you. Mm. And that to that's, me was the, the big line. Yeah. Saying I, it to Aerith, he's not saying, Cloud. To Cloud. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's a, I saw that as like a sign of also just respect from Sephiroth. Roth, mm. like he's like aha okay yeah. so you, yeah. you have learned I, the yeah, ways. yeah I think you are definitely right yeah. Rosie and I think this sort of ties into another theory which came about after the ending of remake which posited that the Sephiroth and an Aerith mm. that are in play in this mm. game are actually characters from beyond advent children yes. so this is yes. not this yeah. is not the original Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. No. This is a Sephiroth who is aware of the branching timelines, yeah. aware mm. of the fact that he was beaten originally yeah. and is now coming back to his past, I guess, yeah. to try and make things happen differently. Yes. Uh, and in Advent Children, Aerith is also there, but in sort of like a, a life stream spirit form. Yeah. Like she has a power after death Similar to, I guess, mm. what you'd call like a Jedi Force ghost, where yeah. she's able to <laughs> she's able to project her consciousness from mm. the live stream, and I think that it is that form of Aerith that appears with Cloud during the final battle of Rebirth. Mm. I don't think that Aerith there, absolutely not. That is not a product of Cloud's imagination at all. No, I yeah, don't no, believe that, that is, either. They're battling in some kind of spiritual realm at that mm. point. Mm. Uh, and yeah, Sephiroth says to Aerith, I underestimated you. Yeah. There's that, when when Aerith gives Cloud the holy materia mm. at the beginning of chapter, more like halfway through chapter 14, I think that is the the live stream Aerith, I'm going to call her. Okay, yeah. Uh, the That's Aerith interesting because that, she does say, this is my dream. The Aerith that has well. already yeah, died. Yeah, she does. That is Some, an Aerith that has already yeah. died in the original events of the game and mm. is projecting her consciousness from the live stream. Mm. She gives a, a full white materia, mm. holy materia, to cloud. Because yep. the Aerith in our timeline, that materia has drained and gone By clear. the whispers, the whispers have taken so her memories the away. the Aerith that yeah. is praying at the altar has originally like a, a clear materia until mm. cloud comes back into our timeline with the full holy materia mm. that, that live stream Aerith has given him. Yeah. And Sephiroth sees it in the sleeping forest. And he, he says, says, he says, that, that shouldn't be here. Belong that, that here. That shouldn't be here. Yeah. Yes. And it's like Sephiroth's like, ooh, Aerith, you're playing like a yeah. good hand, good play, Aerith. Looks like yeah. I'm it's not like the a, only one with knowledge <laughs> of the <laughs> multiverse. The whole thing is Sephiroth versus Aerith. Yeah. It's, it's future yeah. Sephiroth versus live stream Aerith. That's mm. sort of like the main battle that's going yeah. on. And I think live stream Aerith is, is the version of Aerith that appears to Cloud in the Sleeping Forest during mm. that bit where she says to him, I will handle Sephiroth. Yeah. You need to take care of yourself. You need to you need to handle yourself because, you know, mm. we've seen Aerith be saying things to Cloud like, I'm looking for the real you. Yes. So she's she's aware of the of yeah. the trauma that Cloud is incapable of processing at the moment. She's aware that he is falsely remembering things from his past. Mm. Uh, that was my take on that. Yeah. That there is there is a version of Aerith, a spiritual projection of Aerith, mm. also in play. Uh, who I think is going to be really important going forward. Yeah, yeah. But the Aerith from our game, I think, is dead. I was just going to say, because there's also the scene where um, after you've had the, th- the scene with the Black Materia and then Cloud and Aerith, you know, he goes to grab her and they fall off the root tentacle tree. Oh, in the Temple of the Ancients. Yeah, yeah. by the Temple of the Ancients. And um, when you wake up, you're in this other timeline. Yeah. Um, and... Aerith is, you know, walking around with clouds if they're on a date and then Sephiroth says like, oh, so this is where you've been hiding. So as soon as he said that line, I had the idea. It's live stream Aerith. Yeah, Yeah. like this live stream Aerith or like Aerith keeps on swapping places with herself, but they're all kind of in. They're all Mm. kind of like, they know what's happening. So let's say, for example, there were three Aeriths. If they Mm. keep on swapping so that you've got the Aerith in the timeline who's meant to die, for example, mm-hmm. this going into the timeline with Cloud on this date when the world's going to end. And then that's why Cloud, uh, Sephiroth would be like, oh, so this is where you're hiding with mm. the holy material all this yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, that's probably going to be an absolutely, like, no, not I, correct I at all. I think the same thing. I think that, the same thing. That scene does make me think 
more about how many Aeriths are there yeah. and what's really going on with Aerith, even if there's... Because I definitely think there's one that's died, the yeah. one that's in the original Mass, timeline. Yeah, 100%. But then then my question is, how many other Aeriths are there? Because yeah. then you've also got the Aerith, like we say, with uh, when Sephiroth walks into the church and mm. we we don't see anything happen, but it's a big presumption that Sephiroth's mm-hmm. going to go shing. Yeah. Um, I think I think Sephiroth or other causes potentially um, might have killed off a lot of the other Aeriths in different timelines. Mm. My take of it, if you go from the moment where you have that awesome um, Black Materia standoff, mm-hmm. you know when Cloud is, how creepy is he in that scene as well? Oh yeah, Aerith, oh, let's horrible. talk. <laughs> let's, like, I just no. want to talk, and you're like, oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, after they fall, I think they fall into effectively a portal because the mm-hmm. Whispers also can do strange things with. Yeah. Time yeah. as well, yeah. because we forget a lot about them being the arbiters of fate. The idea that they are there to kind of keep things on track. They fall through, you know, what we can assume is like some kind of portal. Mm-hmm. Cloud ends up in this stream of Aeriths. I don't know if that's necessarily her just being quite whimsical. I thought maybe she was just saying that because this is kind of her last chance to be almost happy because the world yeah. was ending. I yeah. was unsure about that at first, but um, I do think that might either be live stream Aerith. Or it's I just, it's I am slightly also drawn to the idea of multiverse of Aeriths. And my reasoning for that is, so we just going through the kind of notion, motions of it, we uh, see her go on the date with Cloud. She takes him to the church. She gives him her white materia. You have that awesome line from Sephiroth, which is like, ah, this is where you've been hiding in a mm. world that's accepted its fate. I think she has is almost being hunted across these different worlds by Sephiroth mm-hmm. and I think she's kind of hidden the materia in this one yeah. yes he then finds it because obviously Cloud fell into it through a rift which I imagine both Sephiroth and Aerith have this very omnipresent energy which yes. I love in the series yeah. Yeah. you get the impression that because of their kind of connection to the live stream albeit one being you know not of this planet but you know very much I guess uh, a blight on the planet's existence and he fell into the live stream at the end of the original game so there's that as well um, and then obviously Aerith being etc um, I think yeah that really for me brought home the idea that maybe this Aerith is sort of hiding her her holy gives it to Cloud he then takes it through to the timeline that we know that all of we've been playing in the yeah. whole time that's when, obviously, yeah, Sephiroth says that brilliant line, that doesn't belong here. That gave mm-hmm. me shivers. I was like, oh, of yeah. course. Yeah, that I know what you're talking um, about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, Cloud's like, oh. <laughs> 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 it back. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, gives it to Aerith in our timeline. At that point, she regains her memories as well, because I think a lot of the memories are kind of... Just the knowledge is bound the up. The knowledge is bound up. It's mm-hmm. the, the ancient knowledge. material is knowledge. crystallised knowledge. Crystallised knowledge of the ancients. So I think yeah. when she gets that back, it's almost like she's getting what the whispers took from her. Yes. So she puts that back in her hair. She then goes and does the whole temple praying and everything Um, and then I think the whole thing with Cloud seeing two versions I still think maybe this is the optimist in me but I think that there is a multiverse that kind of is spawned there when he does that Mm -hmm. I just think he spawns it I think he's still technically stuck in the one that he's in another theory I read is that Cloud because he's now been through the multiverse Mm -hmm. has the ability to exist in more than one or perceive it perceive more than one So which is why he's able to see the rift in the sky sky. at the end and no one else can because did you know as well I found this really fascinating they patched a bit of um, remake on the day that Rebirth came out that changes this, yeah. the very last line that Aerith says in remake. Really? So when she comes out of Midgar, when they all come out of Midgar yeah. and they've escaped the causeway and they've like broken fate's ties and they're off on their own, she looks up at the sky and in the OG she says something like... She um, says, I miss it, the steel I miss sky. The, I miss it, the yes. steel sky. In the patch version she says, the sky... I don't like it. Yeah. Which is like, oh, is she seeing something that we can't see? So that whole de- idea of perception, I love how playful that is. Like, mm. is it, you know, a mental collapse? Is it, you know, the kind of uh, the multiverses and yeah. having that effect on you? I also think there's something in tactility as well. In the first game, when Aerith touches you physically, yes. that's when you can see the whispers. Something similar happens when Zack sees Cloud 
and they cross over in the multiverse. Yeah. yeah. He can't see him and he's waving at him and all of a sudden he punches his arm and they're and in the like, same boom. world. So I think something that Cloud and Zack might have experienced in journeying through those, because they're almost yeah. playing Pong with Sephiroth, aren't they? Across the multiverse. Yeah. Oh, that bit where you get to oh do a synergy ability across dimensions against so Sephiroth is crazy. amazing. That's I just like so seeing Zack and Cloud together because I also love Zack. I and screamed at so that. So when oh. I did that, I was like, Amy's going to love, if I love this, Amy's no, going to Zach. lose it at this bit. Oh, it was it's amazing. so good. Seeing them together together again you know they've been through they've both been through so much yeah. the last mm. time they were physically together I mean obviously multiverses aside Zach carrying Cloud into Midgar in the amended timeline but the last time really in sort of the, the I guess the canon as such of the OG is when Zach dies yeah. and Cloud holds him you know like actually takes his sword off him and you know will you be my living legacy like he passes on his life to him yeah. and it's such an emotional moment and I think that's why Gon Gaga got me as much as it did but yeah I, I think the Aerith in the final fight against Sephiroth is a multiverse Aerith. So I kind yeah. of I agree with both of you in different ways. Well, I, yeah. think, I think there are multiverse Aeriths, yeah. but I think they all die. And mm. that's why I say I, my interpretation is that that is Aerith dying is an has event that to has to happen in all yeah. universes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But after her death, Livestream Aerith is mm. a is a it's a different presence. She's the MVP then. It's, it's live stream. <laughs> you've got live stream Aerith on one side and you've got post advent children mm. Sephiroth on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're battling over whatever they're battling over. Mm. Yeah. Um, I just want to say quickly, another moment that really got me uh, unexpectedly just emotional all of, all of a sudden mm. was just after Aerith has given like the, the white material to cloud mm. and, she's, and they're in their spot and she hugs him and she's like, whatever happens, don't feel bad about yeah, it. Oh, it's yeah, it's not your fault. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God, it and really got me. And it's strangely to the player, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's yes, almost like yeah. breaking the fourth wall. This is, this is the other thing I, way. I wanted to talk about. Like, There's so much going on here that is... Is Sephiroth messing with Cloud, but it's mm. also Sephiroth messing with the audience. Yes. And so much about yeah, remake yeah. and rebirth, there's there's a meta commentary and, and mm. meta themes above what is happening on a surface level. Yeah. So you've got the idea of the reunion, mm. which in the original game is every it's everyone re who's uh, been injected with reunion theory, isn't it? Everyone the who's been injected theory. with yeah. Genova cells converges in one spot. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that's taken a little bit further now in rebirth, and there's the idea, I think where Sephiroth's talking about a reunion of worlds yes. where all of the worlds are coming together mm. and there's like universal life stream. And when mm. a world dies, it, it returns to that universal life stream. Mm. Very much how when people die in the world, yeah. their spirit and their essence mm. returns to the life stream. Yeah. Uh, and also on a meta level, mm. the whole remake project is a reunion of the compendium of Final Fantasy VII. So Crisis Core, mm. Dirge of Cerberus, Advent Children, the original mm. game, Everything is like, mm. everything is coming together yeah, yeah, yeah. into one thing. You're getting a convergence of timelines, exactly. quite literally, aren't yeah. you? And I yeah. think that's what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what it's like, oh my God. When when the when the third game is <laughs> revealed, I, like, when... When the remake ended, mm. I said I, I really felt like I, I cannot wait for the ne for the next game, which yeah. turned out to be Rebirth, and I don't think I've ever been as excited for a game as I have mm. Rebirth. That has gone up another ten levels for so, when yeah. the next game Same. comes out. My yeah. God, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. Knowing what happens in the original game and the mm. events we're likely to see, yeah. just on a surface level, that's exciting. There's yeah. some epic yeah. stuff that happens. But just knowing that the, this story is going to come mm. to whatever conclusion it comes to, yeah. very, very exciting as well. Can we talk about one more thing in the ending as well? So um, first of all, I just want to say the audacity of Cloud Strife to, in that final scene <laughs> with Sephiroth to be like, you know when Sephiroth's like, is this fact? Is this fiction? And Cloud's like, that stuff won't work on me. Yeah. Not anymore. Hard cut to him, sat on a grassy bank. Ooh, black <laughs> material. <Yeah. laughs> Hashtag reunion. Oh, Better. He puts it in the <laughs> sword. Put it in my sword real quick. I'm just going to save yeah. that for Daddy Sephiroth later. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe that. Uh. That, because he's so creepy the way he smiles at it. Mm. Is that white empty materia the black materia? Did it turn into that? I don't People are talking think about that? so. No, I'm not, sure. so. no. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But then they keep talking about how, you know, the confluence of worlds and one of the goals Sephiroth seems to have is not only kind of dominion over all the timelines. Yeah. He wants to converge them into one. He wants one single timeline, presumably in which he wins. Yes. That's what he wants. But he also talks about how, because I guess in the original, he wanted to absorb the life stream to be a god. Yeah. In this one, I guess he can almost absorb all of the timelines. He wants to absorb all of time and yeah. space. All of time and, and space. And become some omnipresent He's got grand ambitions. Being. You can't, you can't ambitious, knock him. He's very ambitious, isn't it? You he's know, very ambitious. Gotta respect the hustle here. Uh, <laughs> 
another thing that I think uh, is being overlooked slightly is Genova. I think mm. Genova's a lot more important than... She's never really explained that well, she, fully yeah. in the original yeah, Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, just sort of pops up for a fight and you're like, yeah. oh, it's Genova this, again. This, this extraterrestrial being that, Harbinger, came, that yeah. came down from the skies 2,000 years before mm. the events of the original game, mm, yeah. had a war with the Cetra, yeah. was like sealed away yeah, and, and yeah. until she was finally unearthed by mm. Shinra and Professor Gast did some experiments and then Hojo took over and yeah. you know, we know how that ended and it, and it resulted in the creation of Sephiroth mm. yeah uh, I think Genova's a lot more important yeah. to the story yeah. than we perhaps realise at the moment uh, the, oh the mural room in the Temple of the Ancients mm. when we got those projections of mm -hmm. the old battles between Genova and the Cetra yeah. yeah I think that was so much more than what was in the original game yeah absolutely and, yeah like deliberately so and then you've got the expanded backstory of, of the, the black, black material, material itself yeah. Yeah. as this thing that's been created by the Gi tribe who for some reason I thought this was like a massive story reveal yeah can't return to, to the, the live planet. stream yeah which suggests to me that they're not of the planet Yes. That they have to be extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial of some kind. Like yeah. Genova. Yes. Yeah. I she don't also know can't me, return to the planet. Yeah, I don't know thing. whether it's me looking too much into this, but when whenever the cam whenever you fight Genova, mm. the camera like crashes onto Genova's face mm. and it looks like she's wearing some kind of skull mask mm. and you see the eyes glaring yeah, behind yeah. this skull mask. Exactly like Gina Tuck. Yeah. Like there's like a, there's a mm. motif there. So I don't know what this is and I don't know whether it's me just thinking too much into mm. this. I'm thinking there's some kind of connection between Genova and the Gi tribe mm -hmm. that is going to be important. Yeah. I am uh, looking forward to learning yeah. more, well, hopefully learning more about the Gi because when you do that whole section in Cosmo Canyon, I was fully like... Mm. whoa yeah. okay what is going on here this is getting like you say a lot more in yeah. depth onto the actual black material itself which I really liked um, and I did feel bad for them when they say okay uh, Red your dad failed us can you get us the black material please <laughs> and then Red just says yeah I'll get yeah, it I'll do it, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> and then immediately sure. after he's like I'm not going to do it <laughs> like, I'm, not gonna I'm actually going to do it there's another thing that happens there where they say to Red 13 okay the promise has been made Yeah, mm. which is a line and again, this is probably me looking way too deeply into this kind of stuff. Mm. But that was the line that was used by the narrator in the original Final Fantasy VII remake reveal trailer at E3 2015. Ooh. He says, Ooh. the promise has been made. Has been made. <gasps> uh, no promises to keep. the Gi say to Red 13, the promise has been made. Ah, interesting. It probably doesn't mean anything at all. I know, but what if it does? Oh, what if, what if it does? does? What, if, what if you're the first one who's like, the Gi are actually incredibly important to what's going to happen in all the <laughs> yeah. timelines? You heard it for well, first. I think, Rob Pearson's right. They are right. important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. who knows? But I, what I, what I think of what I love most about, well, there are lots of things I love about this game. I think it's an mm. astonishing video game. Amazing. Incredibly yeah. brave choices yeah. being made by the dev team. Mm. Knowing how much people love the mm. original yes yeah very how much brave so. is it to to yeah. you know dare to tweak mm. the most iconic scene in all of video games yeah. knowing that fans are going to be like what what yeah, what, yeah, what? Yeah, what? Yeah. uh but i i i i think it's so exciting and i don't know of any instance in video games before where we've had mm. this story that's going to be told yes. over potentially the best part of a decade yeah, yeah. like yeah, yeah. we don't know anything about the third game when no. it's likely to come out yeah. anything at all uh but there was 4 years between remake and, and rebirth mm. and it's just given us i you know i love this mm. i love just it's so good, talking isn't it? yeah. and you just don't i just don't think i can't think of another game mm. series that's done that yeah, yeah typically with final fantasy games they're one and done you know yeah. they're one self-contained entry yeah occasionally you'll get sequels and spin-offs it's normally neatly wrapped but, up isn't you know it? the yeah. game finishes and then you know final fantasy 10 2 it's not a continuation mm. of final fantasy 10 per se like final fantasy 10 doesn't end on a cliffhanger final mm. fantasy 10 wraps up and then 10 2 is released and yeah. you know more yeah. is added to the story whereas this is this is one story being yeah. told over three games and you've got these intervening years in between mm. where yeah. everybody gets to talk about it and mm. Up with fan theories, and yep. it, I I love being feeling part like I'm it. part yeah. of a 
of part of that. And this yeah. is what I meant not earlier. Knowing. It's so exciting. I love not knowing. Yeah. I love not yeah. knowing. Like I live for fan theories. I live for discussions. Recently, you interviewed um, Kitase San, didn't you? And yeah. he said he actually reads fan theories, which I think is so interesting because I love the idea that they're kind of looking at this wider community because we've been a fan of this world and these characters for like... I mean, since 1997, I can't do maths very well, but I know that's a long <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. 20 odd years, you know, like that is an insane amount of time to have invested in this world and to still be so intrigued by it. Yeah. And I think what you said about, you know, they've played a blinder. They've made a really brave choice with that scene, with that kind of way to end Rebirth. But also what I think is so clever and yet no other remake really has done before is they've kind of given us our cake and eaten it too. Because yeah. we're able as fans to have something new to look forward to, mm-hmm. yeah. which is what I loved about remake because, you know, people will have differing opinions on whether or not they should have changed it in part whether they should have just kept it completely as it was in the OG. But we've got the OG, you know? Yeah. The OG exists. It's already there. You can play it. What's great about Remake and Rebirth is that it really encaptures that idea that, like, you're going to see some of your favourite scenes in beautiful, glorious graphics. You're going to visit Costa del Sol, walk around it, go shopping in it, eat ice cream in it. But also, you're able to have surprises you're able yeah. to have things that you don't understand that i love yeah. like they've nailed that mm-hmm. balance of like here is something that you're gonna love revisiting yeah. for nostalgia's sake and here is something that you are gonna really rack your brain 100%. to understand because it's something new yeah. what a yeah. treat i'm so i'm giving. so invested in this story same and if they they'd, have, if they'd have kept well. it if they'd have kept it beat for beat exactly the same as the original yeah. i'd be loving it yeah but i wouldn't be here so invested because I know yeah. what's going to happen yeah yeah, exactly but now yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen exactly and that, yeah, is yeah. mega exciting well this is the thing as well when you said that we had four years between remake and rebirth I still remember finishing remake and yeah. just the way that it wrapped up that part of the story and opened up the world you know the um, the story and how it can go it still sticks with you so when I came to Rebirth I didn't mm. even feel as if personally I didn't feel as if I needed to look at a recap of mm. Remake no. or yeah, anything yeah. because 100%. in those four yeah. years it yeah. stuck with me and yeah. like everyone we've all been waiting and anticipating mm. reading theories uh, it's funny when you're talking about all these theories and stuff because I guarantee you if I read <laughs> what someone else is going to say I'm going to be like my theory's completely changed now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because <laughs> we're all in this what together like, uh, my yeah, interpretation yeah. of it has changed yeah yeah yeah, just uh, talking to you two today has yeah. given me fresh thoughts. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. I also love right at the very end. Sid whistles the Final Fantasy ending theme. Yes, he does. And I was very like, nice touch. Nice touch. Very nice, nice touch. touch indeed. Mm. Well, I think I think that's all we have time for. I am going to go back home and just devour every video article I can find. See, I haven't read or watched on, anything, so now I'm going to be like, what's everyone yeah. else said? I'm like, I am completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the th- at the moment, no one is yeah. wrong, right? No, and no, no one and that's is the right. beauty of it. And th- that's so cool. Yeah. Like, We're all going to work I, together. I love mm-hmm. it. Uh, you know, there are no right or wrong answers at the moment. Like the ending is, is mm. constructed to... To make us like this, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. To make yeah. us not know and to discuss. But yeah, thank you so much for your time, Rosie and Amy. It's been great to have you on the podcast. Uh, please, in the comments, hit us with your mm. own fan theories on what you think is going on at the end of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Do you think Aerith has been saved? Do you think Aerith is just dead? Like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. We want to hear what you think. Thanks very much for watching and listening. Do check out the YouTube channel. We've got a bunch of videos on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and loads of stuff on other cool video games as well. And join us again in another two weeks for another episode of the PlayStation Access podcast. Thanks for listening. Catch you again soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.